everyone, welcome. What I want to do is just quickly share with you some of the top trends we're seeing around the world that are happening in payments. So we sit in a very unique position. We get to see kind of what corporations, what networks, and everyone's doing. And so we try, I tried to step back and consolidate. Of all the things we're seeing around the world, what are the really disruptive things that are happening in payments today? And, and how's that going to reshape the payments of the future? So uh, let's jump right into this. So the first trend that we're seeing and this is probably the biggest one right now, is that after years of battling each other, collaboration is making a big comeback in the payments industry. And let's just walk through that. So before we jump in though, let's just take a step back here. So if you look at where we all started with this, you kind of look at back in the 1930s and 40s, it was pretty simple. Retailers wanted to sell goods, but consumers didn't have money. So they created store accounts. Those store accounts turned into cards. But then somebody had the bright idea and said, you know, I don't really want to carry 15, 20 cards around with me. I'd rather have one card. So thus was born Diners Club initially and then American Express, the concept of a closed network, something simpler, easy for the consumer to use. Not to be outdone, of course, banks came in and said, okay, I can develop my own networks. And they did. They developed their own networks. But the challenge was when you do that independently, it didn't scale. So they finally had the bright idea in the 1970s, and they said, look, let's collaborate. Let's pull this together, and thus was born Visa and MasterCard and the network effect. And the growth in that, just like Paul was talking about earlier, the growth in that has been nothing short of spectacular. Maybe not the 25x every year, but you're talking about an industry that is growing three times the GDP for over two decades. That is the power of collaboration. And what we're seeing and what they learned back in the 1970s is this concept of what we now know as the Metcalfe's Law, which is that the power of the network is exponential to the number of nodes in there. So the more you can collaborate, the more people you can bring together, the more it will expand, the faster it will grow. And what's happened now, and it's a great example, we're seeing this everywhere, but we're seeing well, a great example is one in the US, and it's kind of a, a Venmo type thing that's happening there is that banks tried forever to build their own brands for person-to-person -person payments, but they failed. If you had a Chase account, you'd say, well, do you accept Chase Pay? Well, if you're with Bank of America, you're like, well, I don't know if I accept that thing. So what they've done now, in this fall, they will launch a new product called Zelle, and it's a network with one brand that's digitally driven, built off of APIs that will allow you to go from any bank, pretty much to any other bank in the United States, and make an instant, real-time payment without having to leave that cash in a third party. Think about the potential of that. And don't just think about it, the potential of it being able to do it inside of a bank app. Think about the potential to now bring those APIs right into your SMS, right into Facebook, to syndicate that capability everywhere that you want to be. It's truly the power of the network. What, what we're learning here, and what we're, frankly what we're relearning, is that payments is not a winner-take-all game. Payments is a collaboration game. So switching gears here and just going a different direction, the second thing we're seeing right now is peak rewards. And, and if you look at this, again, um, US side of this, is that since the Great Recession, spending on rewards card has just exploded through the roof. We estimate through a combination of cash back, points, air miles, last year, US consumers got $15 billion in rewards. But what nobody's paying attention to and what we're seeing behind the scenes is this tug of war. And what's happening is, while banks are increasingly using rewards as a way to get more and more consumers in, again, when you look at the ROEs in this industry, you're talking about an industry that has ROEs north of 20, maybe upwards of 30 percent. They've made incredible investments to the point even where some banks have had to announce earnings hits because of the rewards they're giving away. The challenge is, is that the fuel for those rewards interchange behind the scenes is undergoing pressure, right? The Costco deal has not gone without notice. You can see the headlines here, basically for free. Merchants are looking at this and they're saying, hey, why am I not getting a part of this? So what's happening behind the scenes is you're seeing now capitalism take over. You don't need to regulate interchange rates to make it work. In fact, what's happened is the competition between these two is coming in. So we're hitting a point now of peak rewards. And what this means for the industry we'll talk more about this in a few other trends that we're seeing, is that we need a different playbook, right? We've got to start looking at other areas and how we can grow our revenue streams outside of the traditional way that we've grown for the last 
uh, 15 or 20 years. So just, again, going in a total tangential direction here, next trend we're seeing is that account numbers are no longer numbers. They're becoming code, and it's rewiring everything that we do, and it will radically change how we think about the execution of payments over the next decades. This won't happen overnight, but it will happen, guaranteed. And what's, what it is, is if we think about it, all of us know this, we, we think of our accounts as a number, whether it's our bank account, whether it's the card number that we have. But the reality is, is when EMV came out, what happened is inside of that chip is no longer a number. It's actually code. It's Java code. And when that chip is inserted, that Java code can run every single time. It can generate new numbers every single time. Think about the ability of this to extend now the concept of your account is no longer an account, but it's code. And how do you place that code and where do you put it? So let's just switch gears and talk about one area that's already happening, which is tokenization. So tokenization, I think all of us know this. You've probably seen it with Apple Pay and Android Pay for any of you that have been in this space. What tokenization allowed us to do was it allowed you to take the code, the account number, and to, and to put it remotely into a phone. And it seems simple in retrospect, but think about this. This is the first time ever that banks have allowed somebody else to control effectively their card, their user experience, and where it's going to sit. And it was all enabled by the fact that somebody realized that the account numbers are no longer numbers, they're actual code. And you could put that code somewhere else. Take the example, and Paul was talking about this online, and we're seeing this happen right now. Think about online. And today, when you enter your card number, think about a future now where instead of you entering your card number, once you've authenticated yourself, just a snippet of code goes to the website. That code now can only be used at that merchant. If it's stolen, if they have a break-in, it doesn't matter because the code can't be pulled over somewhere else to be used. The opportunity here is tremendous. And this is not occurring just in the consumer side. I use the consumer examples because they're easy for all of us to understand. This is happening in the commercial, corporate, international side. You can take this technology across the board. So the, uh, the next trend here, so, so we're all becoming merchants. And, and again, Paul, you kind of mentioned this. It's very hard out there. Uh, there was a company back in 1999 that had a, had a really bright idea. They said, people have these things called Palm Pilots. And I, many of you in the audience may not remember these Palm Pilots. I see somebody raising their hand. Thank you. Um, but what they wanted to do with the Palm Pilots was they wanted to use the IR code to basically beam money back and forth between each other. The challenge they had, you could easily send the money, you could, somebody could enter their card. The problem was nobody could accept the money. So what they did was they said, okay, let's solve the problem, not of payments, but let's solve the problem of acceptance. The name of that company? PayPal. They solved the ability for individuals, for small businesses, for all of us to take payments. What they realized was the problem wasn't in payments, the problem was in acceptance. In, when you roll that forward now, it's just exploding. We talked about this already, the ability for person-to-person -person payments and how that's expanding, the ability, Venmo, PayPal, uh, Zelle, what's occurring there. We've also seen the advent of personal terminals, whether it's with Square, with, with its iZettle and the components on that side. And I think eventually, PayPal has it right. You are going to see the ability, now that you've got NFC on most of the phones coming out, for the ability just to turn one phone into a terminal, tap it up against the other phone, and make a payment instantly, right there. You know, and one thing I've learned in payments from personal history is that there are no bad ideas, there's just simply bad timing. And I think now is the time that this is gonna happen. You are gonna see everyone become a merchant. So, um, taking, a, taking another look at this, the other trend that we're seeing out there is that is that fintech is maturing, and it's, you're starting to, you're realizing that it's not about fintech, it's about fin and tech. And what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that when we see the venture capital money that's going on up there, increasingly that money is going towards collaborative fintechs, companies that are enabling banks to take advantage of the technology. And actually, Canada is the global leader in this trend right now from all the research that we've done with over almost two-thirds of the investment now going towards collaborative companies versus you know, competitive ones. And just to give you an idea of some examples out there, if you take two of these on the right-hand side of the page, the company's called Blend and Roostify. If you haven't heard of them, what they've done, they've taken the concept of Rocket Mortgage, if you've seen those ads, 
and the simplification of a mortgage. They put it in a cloud-based service, they've marginalized the cost, and they're plugging it into every community bank that they can get their hands on across the United States. There are literally, in the next several, in the next uh, probably several quarters, you are gonna see banks be able to launch rocket mortgage experiences across the board at a marginal cost because of FinTech taking the cost of capital out of this problem and making it the, the barrier of entry very easy. That's a great idea of collaboration. The second one in here I'll just point out is Ripple. They're gonna to talk to I think us later on today. Another company out there using the power of blockchain not to create a new competing network, but to create a network for the banks, with the banks, and to make that happen on that front. You'll see this trend continue um, over the next several years. Um, Paul mentioned this earlier too, and I, I completely agree. Mobile is gonna change everything, and one of the things it's gonna do is it's gonna bring plastic to life. So when we do our surveys out there, what we found is we've actually found when you look at mobile payments at the point of sale, it's actually stalled. For the last three years, it hasn't moved at all. So we went back and we asked consumers, we said, well, why aren't you using mobile payments? And you, know, you can think of it as acceptance, privacy, security, none of that. That was not the issue. The issue was there was no value in it. And when you think about it, um, what we did with mobile payments is all we did was take this dead mute piece of plastic and we dropped it onto a phone. We didn't use the power of the phone to do anything more than that. So I, I'd ask you to think about this. Think about if you had your card right there in your mobile wallet, but instead, when you were able to click on it, you had your balances right there and you could see right where you stood. If you had that every time you were about to make a transaction, would you ever want to let that go? No, because you could bring the card to life, and why? Because it puts the consumer back in control of their finances. You know, if you wanna know where this is gonna happen first, it's gonna happen first in Europe, because with the advent of PSD2 and the APIs that are being created, it's creating a whole set of open API frameworks that are gonna allow secondary or third parties to take bank information and put it into that and start bringing those cards to life. The challenge for banks on this one is that 90% of the app usage is basically checking your balance. Imagine if that balance goes outside, you have to be thinking about how this ecosystem is gonna evolve in a radically different way. Um, next trend here is AI is everywhere. And I, I can tell you from experience here, uh, every single day we're getting a new request to do AI somewhere or another, use it in whether it be fraud or whether it be AML or other parts of it, but that's not the, that's not, I'm gonna try to bring this to life a little bit. So what is AI? I think first a good definition that we start with is that what AI is, is it's three things in our minds. One, it's the ability to sense. So it's the ability to use computer algorithms to see and detect, to detect the stop sign, to be able to see that there's a telephone pole there, to see the, the, the person in the background mowing the yard, to see the fence, just to simply sense what is out there. The second is its ability to comprehend, to then take a look at that and say, of all the signs in there, which one's a stop sign, which one's a speeding sign, how do you detect all that, how do you figure out and categorize this? But most importantly, what AI is about, it's about the ability to act and learn over time, to see what you're doing and then to adjust as you go forward. So let's take an, another example that's just using the mobile concept to bring it all to life for us. Say you're standing at a gas station, you're filling up, uh, pops a message. Would you like to get 5% five, 5 cash back? It's able to geolocate where you are, it's able to tell based on the Wi-Fi signal strength that you're not sitting in the convenience store but instead you're at the pump, you've got that, drops that message right in, sure, why not? I'll click on that thing. Then up comes your wallet. But it turns out that was a Chase card. It says, would you like to switch your card? Sure. Hit the button, switch the card. Card switches automatically, brings it up. You can take this one step further. By the way, I thought about using Canadian cards in here, you know, like having a TD card overtake a CIBC card or something like that. But um, I figured I'd avoid the hate mail from everyone. So I used US cards instead, sorry. <laughs> I think it's a safer play for me. Um, <laughs> But you can take this to the next level and not even have to worry about it. What some people are looking at right now is just the ability to walk into a store and then it automatically picks up the card. And that's the power of AI in action. It's, you know, but the challenge is, is this. For all of us in this industry, and, and this is another part that we've been dealing with um, quite a bit, is that we've built an industry on certainty. As, as bankers and as regulators, we like to know what caused what. What were the variables that I put into that and how did I make that happen? The challenge with AI and artificial intelligence is that you can't decipher how it works all the time. You can't give a simple answer that this variable determined that. Imagine that you want to use information, let's say from a, um, 
you know, from somebody's social network feed to determine if there's fraudulent transaction going on. How do you explain that to a regulator? So what this means for us is it means to truly unleash the power of AI in this industry is going to require, again, collaboration. We're going to have to rethink our bank and regulatory frameworks. And if we don't, we're going to fall behind because this technology is incredibly powerful. So just um, moving on here. Remember, we talked about peak rewards earlier. So how do you, where are the new revenue streams going to come from? So let me just walk you through kind of what we call payments plus plus and where the, where the new opportunities lie. So um, a very simple example of this is, uh, is Google out there. Google has a new technology that they're using called SmartTap. And what that technology allows you to do is when you're making a payment, it allows you to immediately, in parallel, deliver a loyalty card. And that loyalty, that, the way that works is that the terminal senses that you're at, let's say, a uh, Canadian Tire store, for example, boom, instantly delivers the loyalty card, never have to worry about it. Load once and forget. Very convenient, very simple out there. But you can take that technology to the next level, and people are starting to look at this right now. And think of it this way. Think about it. You're walking down an aisle. You can pick up coupons off the shelves automatically. When you get to the point of sale, those coupons are loaded into your phone. And when you go to tap and make that payment, those coupons are delivered automatically. And this is not about what you've seen with all the, you know, the card link coupons where you have to give it off, where the merchant has to step in and pay. This is about getting other people, packaged goods companies, to pay for those coupons. You can also take this technology one step further and think about it really close to home. Imagine that the consumer's in store and they're buying a large ticket item. The coupon can be as simple as something like 0% for six months. You can pay over six months. You can pay over 12 months. You can tie in promotional financing offers with all this technology. If we're going to look beyond rewards, we need to look at how the consumer is using this at the point of sale and what additional benefits you can provide them. And you know, look, this is not, this is not a charity. So to give you an idea of the potential size of this and what people are looking at right now, in the US alone, packaged goods companies spend over $200 billion between advertising and coupons in that space. Yet, 99% of those coupons are still delivered via paper. If you talk about an opportunity to collaborate, work together, and drive scale, it doesn't get much bigger and better than this, and it's sitting right next to what we do every day, which is payments. All right, last but not least, and just bringing this home here, is that you know, user experience, and I know we talked, some folks talked about this yesterday, is absolutely the new gold. But let me explain to you what this means, is that when we look at this, you know, banks traditionally always look at user experience versus their competitors. They make checklists, we see it all the time, the matrix, you know, my features and features. Do consumers look at that? Do they compare one bank's feature list to the other? No, not at all. What consumers compare you to is they compare you to, first and foremost, your experiential competitors. They compare you to the PayPal experience. They compare you to the Venmo experience. They want to see that your experience is as good as that, but they are also comparing you to what we call your perceptual competitors, to your Ubers, to your Facebooks, to your Amazons. They want to see and they expect your experiences to, good, to, as, to be as good as that. So benchmarking yourself against your competitors is kind of the old game. The new game is you've got to be thinking about that across the board. And last but not least, I just want to wrap this up, something that's close to home for me having spent um, several years uh, building out the mobile payments industry in the U.S. is that the question I always get is, why are Google and Apple interested in mobile payments? One thing I can tell you, they are not interested in mobile payments because of the network. They do not want to get into banking. What they understand better than anybody else out there is that the value is in the user experience. And search is a great example of this. 97% of the time when we do a search, we're not interested in buying anything, but you own that right away. You own the ability to monetize everything around it. And that 3% is gold for that 97%. The same thing holds true in payments when we, based on the research we've done. About 97% of the time, you just want to make a payment and be done with it and make it simple. But the 3% of the time that you're interested in those coupons, those offers, that promotional financing, creates enormous value. And sitting there is really the opportunity, but this will not happen without collaboration. So I um, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for everything.